Welcome everyone to the Race, Zero, Race to Zero webinar series, Uniting Asia to Combat Climate Change. Earlier this morning, we talked about uh, greening the energy sector, and now we'll do a deep dive on the role and challenges of the transport sector in addressing these climate change challenges. Um, before we begin, a bit of housekeeping. Our format for this webinar is that we will all, or we will let our speakers present first, and then we will have a Q&A session at the end. So please do stick around. However, please feel free to post any of your questions or comments that you may have at any point during the session. We will collate them and have our speakers address them during the Q&A. We also request that you indicate the name of the speaker to whom your question is addressed to. With that, let me play a video from Arab Manila's Managing Director, Raul Manlapig, to formally open the session. The UK government, government will host the 26 UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, or COP26, in Glasgow in November. This COP brings together government leaders and other stakeholders to discuss the actions and resources needed to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Transport is a critical sector in efforts to address climate change because it accounts for 16% of global greenhouse gas emissions with road transport being responsible for the bulk of the sector's emissions. The share is even larger in the Philippines at 30%. Generally, as economies and incomes grow, the demand for work and leisure travel also rises. Rising income is also closely associated with greater car ownership and increased car mileage, which often come at expensive trips by low carbon modes, such as walking, cycling, and public transport. This is true for the Philippines where private car and motorcycle ownership as well as vehicle miles traveled from these carbon intensive modes continue to grow rapidly. Without aggressive and sustained mitigation policies and actions, transport emissions are projected to increase by 40% by 2050. This is the opposite of the net zero decarbonization pathway that is consistent with the Paris targets. While challenging, the good news is that Pursuing low carbon transport also deliver multiple sustainable development co-benefits. Among these include improvements in air and health, increased energy security resulting from reduced energy costs and dependency on oil imports, reduced traffic congestion and increased productivity. However, transitioning to a sustainable and low carbon transport requires a contextual approach. Countries and regions have different economic models, levels of urbanization, technological adoption, existing public transport provision, and even different cultural attitudes to transport. These all impact the tools and resources available, as well as feasibility of strategies to decouple economic development from the growth in transport emissions. Our session today will cover the unique challenges and opportunities of greening the transport sector in the country. You will also hear some examples of projects that demonstrate how this could work. I hope you find this session meaningful and I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for coming. Our first speaker leads the Sustainable Transport Initiatives of Clean Air Asia. Her work focuses on clean fuels and vehicles, including fuel economy and electric mobility, low emission urban development, active transport, and green freight and logistics. She supports the management, implementation, and coordination of projects of Clean Air Asia together with a team of specialists and researchers. May we now have Ms. Kathleen de Matera Contreras. Hi, thank you for having us, for having me here. Um, great. So good morning to all, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you so much for allowing us to be here and be able to contribute to, to this discussion. So uh, my name is Kathleen de Matara Contreras and I am with Clean Air Asia. And I'm going to be talking about um, opportunities and challenges for decarbonizing and enhancing uh, resilience of the transport sector. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce um, our organization. So uh, we are an NGO with a vision of Asia without air pollution. Right. So to reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions in Asia. We work with various stakeholders specifically to inform action 
build capacity, uh, and guide policy development and implementation. So we work with uh, policymakers, academic and research institutions, um, international development partners, and financing institutions, other NGOs and CSOs, uh, and other key stakeholders to develop and implement these solutions. No? So, uh, we are headquartered, of course, in Manila. So uh, we have also an office, however, in Beijing in China and in Delhi in India. And just to also introduce to you, um, these are just some of our work at the regional, national, and city level. So we have a lot of knowledge products that we are working towards, um, and we are pursuing interventions in air quality management, uh, emission inventory, uh, health mapping, science-based clean air action plans, uh, coal-fired power plant standards, uh, trans uh, and transport like on cleaner fuels and vehicle vehicles like electric mobility and e-mobility. So. I actually just have two main points here. So, uh, and you would see this throughout the, the discussion later, I'm sure. So first um, is that there are a lot of solutions and policy instruments to support uh, different strategies and measures to decarbonize the transport sector. The second is that the, these measures can actually support the social, uh, economic, and environmental object objectives as you would uh, observe later on as we go through the slides. Yeah? So, um, so think about this for a second, okay? Uh, what would you do when your tummy is getting bigger? Would you A, buy bigger clothes or avoid unnecessary eating? Okay, so some of you might answer A, some might answer B. And if you answer uh, B, C, and D, that's good, right? So why is that? Okay, so actually in the transport sector, there is a similar framework called avoid, shift, improve. Okay, so these are framework of strategies. Um, of, you know, a lot, a lot of people know about avoid, shift, improve um, within the transport sector and the planning sector. So avoid first, let's go to avoid. Avoid are actually strategies uh, to reduce travel or reduce the, the, the number of trips or the need for motorized travel. Okay, so you also reduce the travel distance. So, um, and I'm sure this is quite um, relatable for a lot of um, urban areas here. Um, we have a lot of mixed use development and townships being developed all over uh, and a lot, a lot of places in Asia, in Asia right? So um, the second strategy here uh, is, are the strategies to shift people to more energy efficient modes of transport, okay? Uh, we call these, uh, or, or you, you bring them to higher occupancy vehicle. So some of the examples there are walking and cycling, uh, public transport, including buses, uh, railways, new mobility services, Okay, then we have the improve strategy. So you remember the, the slide earlier, so it's like a combination of all these strategies. So the third strategy here that we are showing as one of the opportunities to decarbonize um, is improving the efficiency of operations, technology, vehicle technology, and the fuel. So some of the examples here that we have uh, are electric mobility, uh, echo driving or changing the behavior of the drivers. We also have improving the fuel economy or, um, or like, you know, the kilometers per liter, improving the vehicle technologies. We also have uh, vehicle inspection and maintenance and compliance to emission regulations. So um, support all of that. There are a lot of policy instruments to reduce emissions. So I won't go into the detail of this slide, uh, but just to also uh, briefly present these, as uh, some of these instruments are like the planning instruments um, to reduce the need to travel. Um, you want to bring people and activities uh, a lot closer together, okay? Uh, and we'll get to that uh, shortly. Uh, we also have regulatory instruments to restrict the use of uh, motorized tra tra vehicles, uh, like certain motorized vehicles, I mean. And then we also have economic um, to discourage the use of motorized vehicles. Information instruments are uh, in instruments to increase the awareness of alternative modes. Right? So um, how do we get people to walking and cycling? We also have investments towards improvement to reduce the impact on carbon emissions. Um, so, but ensuring livability of cities, um, it's not just about compactness. So we talk a lot about, you know, mixed use and compactness and in putting people in, in one dense space. And so when we talk about um, avoid strategies, 
to reduce the need for motorized transport, we often think about that. But this begs the next question, okay? So are we making our cities livable? And so if, as, as a lot of you have observed, um, transport is very much linked to how the city is developing. You know? So population density, um, and the land use mix affect the way that we travel. So that includes also uh, our choice of transport, whether I will use my bike or I will go to the place of employment by foot, um, that affects my choice, right? Um, it's not about density and compactness. Interestingly, there's one study suggesting that once population density exceeds um, 80 persons per hectare, other factors also become important in determining uh, travel patterns in cities. So a lot of cities in Manila are, are very dense. So we need to rethink other factors like urban layout and street design. So you see here, ATPPH, this is the, the line there. And Manila is somewhere here. So um, the connectivity also of the entire stock of streets uh, affect the environmental impact of transport. So here's a good overview of how our streets generally look like okay, in Manila. So there's actually a way to measure the level of, of disconnectedness or the sprawl. No? So that's called the SNDI, uh, from which they found that we have a high level of SNDI. So a lot of uh, high uh, street network sprawl. No? So one possible uh, suggestion there was that uh, suggest uh, explanation suggested by the study is that there is a rise of a new middle class retreating to gated communities. No? So with that urban expansion, um, there were little uh, to no access by public transit or by walking. So, and this is the, now going to the walking. So now we're moving to shift. One example is the shift. So poor street connectivity can be seen as a way in general no, by a, a lot of the, you know, the new middle class uh, as a way to generate social and physical exclusivity. So uh, this is a familiar scene for a lot of us. Um, there are amenities like footbridges, but there, it's not enough or they may be uh, uncomfortable for a lot of the, for, for, for vulnerable groups. Like if I were walking around with a stroller, this would be quite challenging for me. Um, so, but where's the untapped opportunity here? So um, uh, there is a walkability, there was a walkability survey that was uh, done a couple of years back. And while this is a bit uh, old, it still holds true for a lot of Asian cities. No? So um, it found that uh, about 30% of the trips are actually less than three kilometers. So I know a lot of people, a lot of us can, can walk malls or do errands with possibly longer distance. So this is an insight that we should use to develop walking infrastructure to um, encourage people to walk. So this is an untapped opportunity. So it's, a, it's one of the most cost-effective measure providing amenities to get people towards walking and cycling. Huh? So aside from that, uh, what could complement the um, physical infrastructure changes? So we have here um, hard measures that should be supplemented by uh, low cost soft measures. And so how do we influence people to actually use these public transport and walking and cycling uh, infrastructure? And so um, TDM actually, or transport demand management, um, influences people. This is comprised of a set of strategies to reduce the demand uh, for travel, especially single occupancy vehicles. So um, some of the examples here are, um, you know, you want to organize the services, the public transport services, providing and apply, applying incentives and disincentives, and giving um, information uh, to, let's say, public transport routes uh, and the time, the schedule, improving all of these amenities and infrastructure also to ease the, their use. Um, I'm almost towards the end of it, but uh, just a few more points here. So here's an example also. And what are the opportunities that we can look into on the two and three wheelers? No? So they are efficient in terms of moving, moving people and energy efficiency, as you would see in this interesting uh, image. Um, and, but however, they are known for a lot of challenges like uh, congestion, pollution, air and noise, um, and accidents, definitely. Um, but there is a way to uh, tap this uh, opportunity that we have two wheelers or three wheelers as a more dominant mode of transport. So first thing to look into is reorganizing the two and three wheelers. And second is transitioning them to electric two and three wheelers. Right? So 
Um, in Asia, electrification as a means to decarbonize the transport sector is not just needed on uh, from cars and buses and trucks, as you would see on the image here. And there are other vehicles, especially smaller modes of transport, that we can start um, transitioning towards that, to electrification, yeah? Uh, we have a, uh, we are testing this one in Pasig City, one of the cities in the Philippines. So we are, we have set up a steering committee uh, on electric mobility. And the goal of that um, steering committee is to plan to lead the, the, the planning and the implementation of e-mobility in the city. So we are testing the smaller modes of e-mobility in Pasig City um, with the support of several organizations as you would see at the bottom of the screen. Um, if we have more time later, we can talk about the experience so far in the pilot testing. Um, so this is uh, how it looks like for now. Um, of course, we're still developing and developing the prototypes, um, but and we are also part of the global initiative that will you know, test these innovations um, in starting with PASIG you know, in Kathmandu and also in Nanjing, right? So um, this is uh, my last slide. So as you would see, uh, decarbonization of the transport sector really needs to be underpinned by uh, uh, transport and land use planning and transportation demand management or mobility management. So whether we'll be talking about walking, cycling, immobility, or cleaning our vehicles and fuels, it's important that we think beyond just the road infrastructure or the hard infrastructure here. So how do we do that? Um, first, um, we would like to emphasize the need for data to improve the policy and planning. So a lot of the challenges on where investments could be made towards are due to the lack of evidence to support the policymakers. So it's important to know the baseline, meaning that the status and trends, where are we now? Where do we want to go? How do we get there? Um, second is to build the expertise, facilitate the skill development and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So we work with countries and cities and often we see lessons, uh, a lot of lessons to be learned no, from each other. The third is we would like to really push for strengthening or formalizing the stakeholder engagement process so that policymakers all the way to the users um, and the, the commuters, the general public are on board with the decarbonization agenda. Lastly, uh, proactive dissemination outreach to raise public awareness is related to what I said earlier. So what you want to do is, um, okay, where are the challenges in your cities, in your commute? Uh, how could we support that and how could we expand it? And then how do we, um, how do we make use of media channels to talk about air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions? So um, to raise public awareness, it's important to look, use various communication channels. So later on, I, I understand well, we, we will hear from our colleagues about policies and other mechanisms on electric mobility, uh, I believe. So I am grateful to end my contribution here. Thank you once again to the organizers for this session. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, that was a mouthful, right? Good day, everybody. My name is Sheila Napalang. It is my pleasure to actually share with you the intervention that the department has actually submitted. Um, let me just contextualize um, our, my presentation for this morning, for this afternoon. All right, first of all, um, I think this was already mentioned by Mr. Raul in the beginning, that, it, that the transport sector is one of the biggest contributor as far as GHG or greenhouse gas emissions would be concerned. So in the Philippines, based on this 20, 16 study, this 2016 study, uh, the transport sector was the third largest uh, contributor of, with 33.3 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Now, of the in the transport sector, of the four modes of transport, again, this was also mentioned earlier, the road sector takes the biggest piece of the cake, followed by your maritime and then uh, railway and aviation, right? So as you can see, it's a road sector in the Philippine context that is really contributing a lot. Therefore, in our, in the nationally determined contribution, 
that the department submitted to the Climate Change Commission back in 2019, we were focused on uh, intervention that would reduce greenhouse gas, which would cover transport fleet modernization and inspection, modal shift and infrastructure development. I'd like to just also say that these are unconditional um, interventions, meaning we must, uh, we must honor what we have submitted. And as you can see, uh, at, but before I move there, I'd, I'd like to also say that the principle, the basic principle in the submissions that we've had is that of course, uh, environment is very important. We're now in a climate emergency, but that is actually a co-benefit. An equally important objective of the programs of the department will be making public transportation more accessible to people across economics economic sectors and across ability. So if you know, if you can see, we had four. We submitted four. We submit and, and of the three, so we have bus rapid transit uh, projects. We also have the PUV modernization program, public utility vehicle modernization program, and the railways project. I'm only given 10 minutes. I can't go through all of it. But one component is also the motor vehicle inspection system. We'd like to look at how do we improve the road worthiness of our, um, of, our, of our transportation. Allow me to just dive deeper into the Public Utility Vehicle Modernization Program, because I feel that that is one program of the department that people must, be, oh, must understand well. Unfortunately, the program suffers from its name. Because when people say public utility vehicle modernization program, automatically everyone assumes that it's all about making the jeepneys nicer looking, more environment friendly, but it's actually more than that. Only one component is on the modernization of the fleet. So as you can see there, the traditional jeepney has very poor compliance. So we call them pre-Euro 2 uh, compliance. And but apart from the fuel technology, also the features of the jeepney. Like for instance, you've got a rare rear entrance. Now rear entrance with a high step board would mean it's very difficult for people with disabilities and even women with children to actually um, board the, the, the vehicle, right? And it's not a safe because you have no CCTV, GPS, or dashboard camera. Earlier on, Clarin was saying, I'm part of a network of, of, uh, of academicians who look at gender issues. And this, you know, CCTV and GPS is actually a safety component because a lot of women, based on a study that we did, we did across several cities in Asia, women suffer a lot of harassment on board public transportation. Now, under the modern uh, PUV modernization program, we will modernize the jeepneys with CCTV, GPS, and dashboard camera. But this will also be PW, elderly friendly. It will have free Wi Fi. And we will also look at the automatic fare collection system so that there will be uh, less contact, particularly now this has been most peaceful, right? So we also have other potential, uh, potential measures. Like of course the integrated transport systems we have now we have in, we have um, placed we have now constructed interchange like terminals where people can use so that they can move from one mode to the other right I'd like to just focus on two projects that you have you see on your screen now it's a national and local bikeway project you know the pandemic tragic though it may have, it is to a lot of us has also brought about an opportunity to push for a transport mode that has been relegated to the background for the longest time. And I'm actually talking about the active transport, right? So the biking and cycling. Because of the pandemic, the government actually provided funds so we could build around 522.79 kilometers in major cities, Metro Manila, Cebu, and uh, I think Davao, right? So because of that, we have been able to push this forward. Why is that very important? Well, active transport can provide equitable access to transport because people who do not have enough money to actually go 
and take public transport can you survive the other one though is walking in the philippines i think we're one of the most spoiled people in the world because here even for the shortest distance we would use our tricycles it should be our three wheelers to just get there we with our active transfer program, our national and local bikeways program, as well as the active transfer program of the department, we would like to encourage people to walk the last mile, so to speak, so to speak, using um, active transport. I'd also like to just highlight as the greenways, which is supposed to also facilitate movement of people between stations and centers of urban activity. All right, let's then I have moving forward. Okay, in the next phase of the nationally determined contributions, we'd still look at the expansion of the PUVMP. But with that, now, if you look at what I have on the screen, it's all about it's all about improving fuel efficiency. But what is actually needed is to also um, shift to a electric vehicle. No, part of the fleet should also be able to shift to electric vehicle. All right. Now let me draw some. I I I'm also glad that um uh, Dr. Biona is going to talk after me because this is more his field, right? But let me just show you. This is 2019 data that we have on electric vehicles. So as you can see, the most numerous that we have would be e trikes and e motorcycles. Now only I think this is only three buses. I think, yeah, only three electric buses and at least 389 public utility vehicles that are run on electric, right? I, I say that because in the local public transportation route planning, which is part of the omnibus policy of the department, each local government unit is encouraged to develop what we call a green route. So the green route will have, um, electric vehicles running it, right? So there's a thoroughfare for sustainable transport and mobility options like electric vehicles. All right, so far um, we have two enabling environment and I, I'm very happy that Dr. Biona is gonna talk after, after me. This is probably gonna expand this a bit more. There's a pending bill because one of the problems for EV is really charging stations and all that. No? So, at 13, there's an SB, there's a pending bill on electric vehicles and charging stations act, which would require the comprehensive roadway roadmap on electric vehicles, as well as installation of stations across the Philippines. It would also require 5% of the government and corporate seats to be made up of EVs within the time frame prescribed. I read, and it would support the greenhouse requirement for the public transportation. In the department, we also have a low carbon urban transport project, which is really to look at how to enable the, the, the environment. Sorry, I'm just looking at my watch because I have 54 seconds left. All right. And so therefore, these are the, I'd like to end my presentation with these three things. These are the critical factors for increasing convergence to e-mobility in the Philippines. First is to integrate it into the public transportation plan. I think that's the most equitable. The second one, of course, is the implementation of the SB 1382 and other EV-related legislation. We would also like to see an increased participation and investment of the private sector. And I think Dr. Biona would be great in discussing that. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Asik Sheila, and I'm sure our audience would be interested to know more about the projects that you just mentioned. Um, but for now, let's go to our third speaker. He is the Executive Director of the Electric Vehicle Association of the Philippines and the Executive Dean of the Enrique Razon Junior Logistics Institute of the De La Salle University. He is a board member and technical advisor of Toho Motors Corporation, one of the largest electric vehicle manufacturing companies in the Philippines. He is also the senior e-mobility expert and a consultant in various projects by the World Bank and Clean Air Asia. 
He led the Department of Trade and Industries Electric Vehicle Policy Study to guide electric vehicle adoption in the Philippines and has closely worked with the Land Transportation Office in crafting national electric vehicle regulations. May we call Mr. or Dr. Manuel Biona, please. Thank you very much for the invitation to be part of your event today. Good afternoon, everyone. I shall be talking about four points this afternoon. First, why should we push for immobility? After which, I shall be providing updates on the local immobility sphere, a review of the local immobility market, and a look at some strategies to accelerate immobility adoption in the country. Why immobility? In a study we conducted for the NR, it would be not noted that the replacement of GPs fully by eGPs in Metro Manila alone provides 8.5 billion health benefits annually. That is in the states to around 200,000 for each unit adopted. We can see clearly in the PM dispersion plots how ambient pollution concentrations change. While there will be some incremental impacts created in some areas outside of Metro Manila, the overall benefits is overwhelming. Philippines is importing about 98% of its petroleum requirements and transport use accounts for bulk of this. EVs are expected to improve the country's import and export balances and diversify the primary energy mix. It has been repeatedly asked if we are indeed mitigating greenhouse gases if we go EV, considering that fossil sources account for majority of our power generation mix. Simulation shows that EVs are expected to cut down around 50% of the fuel cycle greenhouse gas reductions for e-buses, e-jeepneys, and e-trikes. The lower greenhouse gas intensity of the production of fuel used in power plants compared to petroleum also contributes to these reductions. Last but not the least, the country needs immobility for industry preservation and growth. The country could not be sleeping and just realize one day that our automotive industry is dead because we're stubborn to be recognized, to recognize that the era of internal combustion engines has ended. As of March 2019, the estimated number of e trikes in the country are around 1,500, but may be assumed to be more than 3,500 units now, considering the full de deployment of the DOE e trike program. The Egypt needs on the roads are estimated to be at 252 units, while electric two wheelers are more than a thousand. We have currently around 126 AC chargers, which are mostly owned and operated by electric bicycles and jeepneys, fleet operators stationed in 18 battery swapping stations throughout the country. There is only 11 DC fast chargers installed, most of which are stationed in government facilities. There has been an increasing interest among charging network service providers in recent years. Last year alone, EVAP welcomed four new charging infrastructure network provider members. There has also been an increasing number of electric vehicle models available locally. EVAP is hopeful that finally the electric vehicle and charging infrastructure bill becomes a law before the end of the current Congress. It is now scheduled for BICAM deliberations next month. The LTO has recently released the electric vehicle guidelines and regulations, which should clear out any vagueness on registration, licensing, and operations of the vehicles. The Department of Energy has recently also released the policy framework for the charging infrastructure development and operations while DTI is in the process of crafting the electric vehicle incentive strategy. The industry also welcomes the planned integration of green routes in the ongoing PV modernization program. 
Electric vehicles in the country are not levied excise taxes, while e-mobility-related industries may enjoy enhanced tax deductions and import tariff exemptions under the Green Jobs Act, although no one has tried tapping it yet. The electric vehicle bill proposed pushes for the inclusion of e-mobility-related industries for at least 10 years in the strategic investment priority plan of the CREATE bill. The House version of the bill provides VAT and tariff-free exception on vehicles charging equipment, components, parts, and capital goods for five years, while an integrated incentive program is being developed by DTI for the EV industry. Several government and international supported projects are ongoing right now. This includes a World Bank e-mobility road mapping project focusing on public transport, the Department of Energy e-mobility road mapping program, which covers all other market segments, the UNDP low carbon urban transport program, UNE's electric two and three wheeler program, and Solutions Plus Urban Living Laboratory Project in Pasig City, and the Plan Unido GF Immobility Project, among others. There are also a number of market development initiatives that are ongoing, including the EGP Green Routes, as mentioned earlier, and the Davao High Priority Bus System. It could be noted that the proposed EV bill lays down the minimum EV adoption share in public transport commercial, and government fleets at 5% to be increased over time. The table shown lists down the potential EV market in the country in addition to the household market. The shades in the table corresponds to the amount of effort to address the challenges indicated. The darker the shades, the bigger the challenge. Note that currently we are just mostly focusing on tricycles, electric buses, and chimneys. But in fact, this could just be a small part of the potential market. EV diffusion in other markets could be easier considering the minimal challenges involved. The EV industry is now recognizing this and starts also to expand their focus. The table highlights also how the technical and financial capabilities vary across market segments. This leads us now to our next slide. The differences in capabilities emphasizes the need for market segment focused solutions. Strategies have to be customized based on the, reali on the realities in each of the segments. This includes the business model, support required, sourcing strategy, as well as adoption regulations. Let's take first the case of buses. There is currently no company producing electric buses locally, but a strong party building capability exists, which we could capitalize on and expect that some locally assembled units may already be possible in the medium term. In the short term though, buses would have to be sourced elsewhere, thus easing up tariffs on the electric buses should be considered. The viability of running electric buses relative to conventional units is a major issue. The government would therefore have to be heavily involved in rolling out pilot programs in the short term. Investment load should then be shared with the private sector in the medium term before adapting a new energy vehicle credits like strategy in the long term. The NEV credits program was introduced by China, imposing a minimum NEV share in the sales of automotive companies, wherein violations of which will be subject to fines. Companies may buy credits from others that have excess credits to build up points and avoid the fines. A similar concept may be adopted for bus operations. The situation 
of the cheap tea market segment, on the other hand, is very different. Electric cheap teas are produced locally, thus tariff easing is not advisable. Likewise, the economics of Egypt teas are a lot more positive than electric buses. And the financial capabilities of the cheap tea sector is also very different from those of bus operators. Thus, government support would have to take a different form. I will not go over each of the cases, but I would just want to highlight the need for a market segment focus strategy and, the, and no solutions feeds all. We did some market modeling and the projections indicated that electric vehicle household adoption will be very slow without policies and incentives. The removal of tariffs alone are expected to increase annual EV and PHEV sales and vehicle stocks by 2030 by around three times. This emphasizes the importance of incentives to support e-mobility adoption in the household sector. Before I end my talk, just a couple of key points. Why should Philippines go for e-mobility? Okay, four points. Number one, industry preservation. Second, livability. Third, climate concerns. And fourth, energy security. These are now ex exciting times for immobility in the country, considering the developments mentioned earlier. And the presentation also emphasizes that immobility is beyond cheapness tricycles, and buses. Capabilities and conditions vary across immobility markets. Thus, market segment focus and integrated strategies should be adopted. Thank you very much, and once again, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Biona. And we can see that e-mobility is definitely one of our major way forward when it comes to greening our transport systems. And um, our final speaker is our very own transport consultant in Metro Manila. She has extensive experience as a technical lead and policy advisor in public transport modernization programs, including transitioning to lower emission alternatives. She leads the Asian Development Bank's electric bus feasibility study for the Davao High Priority Bus System and is an e-mobility specialist in the World Bank's policy development project for electric mobility in Vietnam. She has also held leadership roles for German international cooperation projects with the DOTR on the GPM modernization program and on various low carbon transport action plans in the country. Let me welcome Ms. Christina Villaraza. Christina, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. As we've seen from the previous presentations, the Philippines has made efforts in moving towards a low-carbon public transport. Um, so I will be talking about this in the context of Davao City's planned high-priority bus system, which would potentially introduce the country's first electric bus system. So to provide background, the city is the third most populous in the, in the Philippines and is expected to grow further, which also re represents growing transport and energy demand and implications on climate. Public transport is highly, highly informal and is dominated by jeepneys, which are old and polluting vehicles of pre-euro emission standard. Over 7,000 of those are operating in Davao City. So unregulated operations has led to productivity losses of about $54 million daily. If you combine operational issues with a highly polluting public transport fleet, that has led to road transport being the second largest source of carbon emissions and the largest source of air pollution uh, nationwide. So to address those issues, the Department of Transportation, with financial support from the Asian Development Bank, is seeking to introduce a formal bus system, which will fully replace the 7,000 jeepneys in Davao City. The modern bus system will have uh, 29 bus routes covering 600, over 600 kilometers with 1,040 buses and supporting infrastructure. And the targeted operational date would be in August 2023. So Arup has been uh, appointed as the consultant for this project. And at the onset, 
Arup alongside ADB has proposed to explore the feasibility of introducing battery electric buses instead of Euro 4 diesel buses, given their sustainability potential. So that feasibility analysis has therefore been undertaken as a spin-off study to this project. So there were a lot of conversations with various uh, key stakeholders to draw out the main barriers and risks to the adoption of electric buses. The project proponents, ADB, uh, the Department of Transport, and the local government unit were more concerned with the higher investment cost requirements. Uh, DOTR and the LVU were also concerned with their lack of familiarity in operating electric buses. And power sector government and private stakeholders raised the issue of whether the power grid and distribution system would be able to accommodate the significant power demand requirements associated with electric bus charging. So um, with those barriers in mind, um, and to build the case for the introduction of electric buses, we, we devised ways on um, in order to, to, uh, to achieve these solutions. So we developed a tool um, to simulate how buses would operate based on a wide range of parameters, including their route characteristics, vehicle-related constraints, and various charging schemes. So the tool allowed optimizing dispatching and charging times. And by doing so, this helped to minimize the number of buses that would be needed. And in turn, that would minimize the required investment. So the tool also demonstrated various bus activities, including buses in operation and those that are charging at a highly granular scale. And by demonstrating that, this also helped to increase confidence that such new vehicle technology would be technically feasible. Another strategy that would support the feasibility of electric buses was to manage energy consumption schedules. So we've, we've developed a tool that has um, that allows spreading out charging schedules or the number of buses simultaneously charging in order to bring down the power demand at peak hour. So um, this strategy reduces the number of power plants required and facilitates the more efficient production of power. And then we took a further step and introduced uh, solar energy uh, to support electric bus charging and reduce pressure on the grid, considering that the Mindanao grid mix is largely sourced from fossil fuel sources. So the scheme would also involve tapping into a battery energy storage in order to ensure uninterrupted service and resilience even during outages. So this solution particularly supports sustainable development targets, uh, on promoting low-cost clean energy. In justifying uh, the overall competitiveness of an electric bus scheme over a diesel scheme, we looked into the incremental costs and benefits, and that, cover, that, that covers not only the investment and operational costs, but also uh, other externalities um, that would include uh, social damages from greenhouse gases, health impacts, and balance of payments from fuel imports. And our analysis has demonstrated that operate, operational and maintenance savings um, of, up, of up to 23% um, could, be, could be gained, and also uh, 7 billion pesos worth of savings from net external benefits. So that would include or translate to a 25% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, 15% reduction in health costs, and 41% reduction in fuel imports. So this project in a span of six months has received uh, approval from the government to proceed uh, to more in-depth uh, planning and engineering work. This would be the first electric bus system in the country and would potentially be the largest electric bus deployment in the region. Um, also, uh, the collaborative approach in undertaking this project has also helped upskill decision makers and planners in planning low carbon transport systems and has also increased interests and discussions in government and industry circles to upscale electric buses in other cities. So at the policy level, this supports uh, Philippine national development targets. So that includes accelerating infrastructure development, and also fostering a clean and healthy environment. Um, this also supports um, national international commitments, including sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. 
So just to, just to conclude, uh, I want to conclude uh, with these key, key takeaways. Um, these are uh, key in enabling low carbon transport transitions. So the first one is um, uh, would be uh, these types of transitions do require collaborative and context sensitive solutions. Uh, this is particularly relevant in developing countries where there is uh, one uh, limited financial capacity uh, to cover for the additional investment required by cleaner vehicle technologies, and to where there is lack of technical awareness to support the use of, of newer technologies. So an in-depth understanding of these local rea realities is required to introduce tailored solutions. Another key message uh, in justifying the competitiveness of lower carbon transport systems, despite their higher investment requirement, is the need to account for operational savings and other external benefits. So uh, adopting electric buses in Davao City would translate to higher operational savings, mainly because of cheaper power costs compared to fuel costs. And aside from that, um, electric buses do offer a huge climate change mitigation potential and significant benefits may be derived from that and also from reduced fuel imports and health impacts. And lastly, this project also taps climate financing. So it is very important to leverage on innovative financing uh, mechanisms uh, to support the higher investments required by cleaner solutions. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And um, I think this underpins the promise of e-mobility in the country. So that's good to hear. And that wraps up our uh, presentations and we will now move on to the Q&A. But before that, I'd like to invite back the, the panelists for today, um, Kathleen de Materas Contreras from Cleaner Asia, Asek Sheila Napalang of the OTR, Dr. Manny or Manuel Biona of EVAP and LaSalle and Christina Villaraza of Arab. And I think this was a very balanced conversation because we have some different lenses and perspectives on how to tackle decarbonization. Um, you have Kathleen who is who presented as themes uh, on how to approach it from a policy and also a strategy uh, and policy instruments um, level. And then you have um, Dr. Sheila, who presented the myriad of um, project solutions that the, the government is uh, has installed for us. And then you have Manny, who um, tackled on the market and also on the academic side, and how the Philippines is faring when it comes to global and regional trends when it comes to e-mobility. And then you have um, Christina, who, who um, detailed the outcome of a project that we did in Davao. Um, so yes, we, we're just waiting to... Um, for our technical team to sort of um, give us a heads up or a, a green light to start the, the panel uh, discussion. But we did receive some really good um, questions from the audience. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So we're, we're good to go. Um, the first question that I have here is for um, Asik Sheila. So um, based on what you showed earlier, there are a lot of promising public transport projects, including the PUV modernization and then um, um, a list of rail projects, um, as well as complementing infrastructure. You have the greenways and, and, and other projects. But some of them are uh, a little bit wary that um, as we enter into a new administration, some of these projects may be shelved or halted, or they are perceiving that these projects are probably concurrent to the current administration. So in terms of implementation, can you shed some light to this very valid concern? All right, thank you for that question. Um, First of all, let me just tackle PUVMP. PUVMP is already institutionalized because it does have a policy called the Omnibus Franchising Guidelines, right? But it is true. I know the concern because as we move administration, you know, this it would change, but at least there is already a policy because I think that's very important. You know, for sustainability, it should already be institutionalized. It's not just a project level. Second, hmm. for the railway projects. So the railway projects are already ongoing and will have to be um, sustained until its completion, right? Um, uh, I, I think to a large extent, particularly the program of the PUVMP will be sustained. Uh, one of the things I was not able to talk about was the service contracting that we're doing now under the, um, under the Bayanihan 2 Act. 
which I think has also been an inno uh, innovation that was made possible by the COVID-19, by the pandemic, right? So even the congressmen and the, and the senators, they're all in agreement that this is a good program. So I guess what I'm saying is true. There is a possibility because that has happened before uh, that there will be changes in the policies. But I'd like to take comfort in the fact that uh, the PUVMP particularly is already a uh, is already institutionalized, and um, if it's seen as a good thing, then people will also, you know, sustain it too. Okay, I mean that's uh, that's I think that gives a little bit of relief to our audience that at least the PUV modernization has already been institutionalized. Thank you for your response, Dr. Sheila. Much appreciated. Now um, I would like to move on to this question of about e-mobility. And I think um, either Dr. Manny or Christina can answer this. The first question is, how do you see charging infrastructure being developed when there is no quote unquote, no demand to start with? In the same way, how do you see EV adoption increasing um, if there is still no charging infrastructure? Uh, and probably, um, para tuli -tuli, um, so, so Dr. Manny can um, uh, speak continuously. The, the last question is, um, what about the readiness of our grid and power ecosystem in the country? Can we accommodate the energy demand um, well, since you mentioned that there are some challenges in the market? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Irvin. Uh, um, I think that's a very good question. Um, to answer that, um, if you look at the data in Europe, for example, on early adopters, uh, around 80% of the vehicles are, actually are charged at home. And the projections indicated that uh, eventually that could go down to 60%, but still it's going to be predominantly charged at home. So um, not having the charging network is not a uh, deal breaker for EV adoption. Okay, Although having the charging network uh, facilitates the greater adoption of the vehicles because it manages the uh, range as anxiety uh, issues. But of course, at some point, we really have to develop the charging network and how do we do that? Um, um, in other countries, they, they proceeded by uh, first doing a lot of government investments, which may not be that viable in our case, considering the limited uh, resources. But what we can do locally is to first look at the commercial sector and the public transport sector where adoptions could be mandated. And we've seen a very strong interest among the charging network providers to partner with this sector as long as uh, uh, there is a uh, sustained adoption. So I think we can start with that sector first. We can match the demand uh, for the EVs and also for the charging uh, for the char charging services. And uh, okay, those initial uh, charging points could also be shared to the to to the to the household uh, to the household users. So I think uh, uh, that is how it's going to look uh, is going to going to be in, in in the future. And in, with your second question, uh, we've way, way back, so I think sometime 2018, we did a study for DDI and we modeled the charging demand um, based on certain uh, adoption trends. We actually also modeled the EV adoption um, from now until 2030. And um, we found out that um, the grid will be able to handle it. Yep. So I think it's not, it's not an issue. Uh, but we might need to look at the uh, power distribution side. When I say grid, I was just only referring to the power generation side. But of course, there are several, there are three components like the power generation, the transmission, then eventually the this distribution. So okay, on that side, then I think uh, further studies needs to be done. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. And I think more to this um, one one. Um audience also ask if you can reiterate the um, the difference between traditional and e electric vehicle when it comes to um, emissions, G GHD emissions? Yeah, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we did some modeling. Uh, we, we, we looked at uh, what well, I presented was, was just limited to the cheap diesel tricycles and the buses, but we also look at all the other vehicle, uh, vehicle types. Mm -hmm. So simulations indicated that based on a fuel cycle, uh, scale, 
um, the adoption of electric vehicles in this segment translates to 50% reductions in greenhouse gases. Um, and part of that is due to the lower greenhouse gas emitted in the production of the fuels used in, in power plants compared to petroleum. Okay, so if you look at, for example, coal, you extract that and then you clean it up, that's it. But if you're talking about uh, gasoline, you extract the crude oil, you uh, undergo distillation, there you also create a lot of emissions and that's how you get gasoline. So even in the fuel production phase, uh, that, that component actually also contributes a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Dr. Biona, for your answers. Um, I would like to ask um, Christina, this is still related to e-mobility. The, the, the question is, will the Davao bus project be bidded out to private sector or do the operations and maintenance of the project um, since Dr. Biona pointed out the lack of capacity of the transport sector? So will it be bidded out to the private sector, the ONM? Yes. So um, uh, we're still exploring uh, different uh, business models uh, in uh, managing and uh, operating the electric bus scheme for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then one more question. How do you think that this um, pilot project in Davao will sort of trickle down to other cities and what will be the anticipated effect? Um, so Mani has uh, provided uh, different business models and um, different contexts require different um, solutions. So um, it's not, uh, so whatever business model uh, was applied to in Davao, it's not, uh, it, it will not automatically apply or work in other, in other cities. Um, and, uh, and so uh, further, further studies and further um, assessment on the capabilities of uh, key stakeholders or key players in the electric vehicle value chain um, is required in order to set up a, uh, an appropriate uh, business model for other cities. So just a quick side note, in your presentation, you mentioned that the operation would be ready by August 2023. Based on the updates that you're doing right now, do you think that's doable? Okay, so um, a comprehensive plan uh, to introduce electric buses has been laid out for Davao, and that covers uh, the buses that need to be procured, uh, which are widely available. Uh, and we've devised ways on how to min minimize our power demand, and in turn, uh, that would uh, lead that would translate to simpler uh, infrastructure requirements uh, to manage the adjustments required by the system, and that would sort of support uh, the readiness of the city. And then on the operational side, uh, the project also includes a driver training program. Um, so that that would ensure that the operators or the, the bus drivers would be ready and capable mm -hmm. in operating the system. Thank you, Christina, um, for your answers. I now move on to um, Ms. Kathleen. Um, you showed um, a slide about physical infrastructure and the complementing soft infrastructure, which um, talks about change in behavior, because um, normally in other countries, um, some of them um, would normally roll out an infrastructure first, which will trigger a, a change in behavior. But we, we do understand that that is not necessarily the case in the Philippines because infrastructure development takes time here. So how do you encourage the change in behavior, let's say in terms of walking or changing the way they travel, even without the presence of a physical infrastructure? Uh, interesting. So I would say like one of the most cost effective measure really is to um, looking at the current um, uh, infrastructure already that are in place. So uh, as you would notice, a lot of people are already using um, whatever walkways are available for them. I mean, other cities um, in other countries, um, they are trying to enhance while they're building the other infrastructure or improving the other uh, walkways and cycling uh, paths. They are enhancing those that are currently there already with better amenities. Um, they are linking them to one another. Somehow, I would say that uh, there are three I would, criteria when we want to push people back to walking and cycling. You want to make sure that uh, walking and cycling are comfortable, convenient, and attractive. No? So um, 
it, there are a lot of infrastructure that are, I would say, expensive in terms of, and, and also it takes a long time to build, no? Yeah. Um, sometimes even beyond the one administration. But if you are looking for the low-hanging fruits, looking at the, the most cost-effective measures, um, there are a lot of untapped opportunities in um, enhancing the walking and cycling, the number of people using these. So, um, hmm. and I heard earlier that in the, you know, in the, projects that we have in the Philippines that we are really linking the first mile, the last mile, and also the middle mile connectivity, like linking the two types of public transport, enhancing the way a tricycle feeds into a, a bus system. So, you know, enhancing the walkways to connect those would be something to really uh, look into. So thank you for that question. But yeah, that would be, I would say, the low hanging fruits that we can check mm -hmm. out. Thank you, Ms. Kathleen. Um, and then in the interest of time, we do still have some questions, but because we're running um, over time, and this would be the last question and it's for Asik Sheila. Um, worldwide mobility as a service is already being adopted and provides convenience to commuters because of its capability to integrate all of the modes of transport under one platform. But currently uh, we cannot implement this because of the current franchising system, which is still very much fragmented into routes unlike more developed cities like Singapore or London, where in the, the air, there are area packaged franchises. So should we further reform the franchising system to consolidate the operation operations of um, public transport to allow further integration on systems? This is a loaded question, um, yeah. such as automated fare collection, dispatching, etc. So basically, it talks about the fragmented public transport and franchising system in the country. Right. Thank you, Clarvin. And in the interest of time, I'm going to make my uh, answer short. But thank you for this opportunity, because earlier on in my presentation, I said that in the PUV modernization program has many components. Unfortunately, people are so focused on the vehicle improvement. But one of the important um, uh, aspects of the PUV modernization program is actually the route rationalization, which looks at the different uh, demands in different routes and look at how we can then integrate. So it's not going to be all rail. It's not going to be all all buses. It has to be looked at from the network perspective. So the policy is already in place and we're working on it mm. so that we would look at network because I think that's important, network. Um, AFCS is really just a technology to improve of services of the public transportation system. And so therefore, it's also a component of, of the PUV modernization program. So for those of you who are interested, you may want to look at the different components of the PUV modernization program because it's really more than just um, it's really more. Uh, it's really more than just improving the jeepney. Okay. Thank you, Asik Sheila. And that was our um, final question for the session. Um, on behalf of Arup, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon and special thanks to our speakers for making time to share their expertise. We've learned a lot, I'm sure. And a recording will be uploaded to the event page. And I would also like to invite all of you to attend the final leg of our webinar series on Friday. We have a session from 11 a.m. to 12 noon on greening the cities and the built environment and another one from 2 to 3 p.m. on the role of nature-based solutions in addressing climate change. We have lined up exciting topics and experts on these themes that you can check out in our event webpage, and please do not forget to register. Once again, thank you, everyone, and have a good day, and hope to see you on Friday.